everyone. Today I'm going to be talking to you about gender and water, but before I begin the lecture section of today, I want you to all put down your pens and paper for a minute and think to yourself about all of the water that you've used so far today. So right now it's about 10.30 in the morning. Uh, by a raise of hands, let's see how many of you have had a shower so far today. Okay, many of you. Gone to the bathroom? Most of you, everyone, great. Um, filled up your drinking bottle. Made a cup of coffee? Made breakfast that used water? Okay, so we can see here by all these hands that most of us have been using a lot of water already today. And by my calculation, if you've done most of those things, you've already used 150 liters of water. That is 10 of this bucket here, filled with water. Now, can I have a volunteer, please, to come and take this off my hands? Yes, come on down. Okay, here you go. I want you to hold that and tell the class whether or not it's heavy. Now, imagine that you're carrying this for one hour every day. Or maybe you're carrying two or three of these. Or you're doing this a few times a day. Well, just in order to get enough water to do the things that we just talked about doing in the morning. Pretty difficult. Okay, thank you. I'll take that. If anyone else wants to come and pick this up, we can do that at the break or when we break up into groups. It's interesting just to see how hard this actually is. So I know it's difficult to attach what we do in our regular lives to what other people do in theirs. It's difficult sometimes to imagine not having water piped into our home or not being able to have a shower every morning. But that's something I want us to try and imagine today while we're going through this lecture and while we're going through these case studies. Try and keep that in the back of your mind. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be using the idea of water as a resource to talk through some of the issues we've already discussed in this course. And they are gendered roles, gendered knowledge, and gendered norms. And by the end of this lecture, you will be able to answer the question, how is gender related to water? And you'll be able to answer how we can take this into account when we're making water management plans. So to recap, so far in our course we've discussed gender, and we have a definition that we've all agreed upon in the last few weeks, and that is that gender is a social differentiation of women and men through processes that are learned, that are changeable over time, and that vary within and between cultures, regions, communities, and households. And these processes manifest themselves in the, in the form of gendered roles, um, by this we mean gendered responsibilities, gendered work, things that are women's jobs or men's jobs. Also in terms of gendered knowledge, we've been talking a lot about environmental knowledge, gendered environmental knowledge to be specific, and how that manifests itself from these gendered roles and responsibilities. And finally we have the concept of gendered norms, or we might want to call this structures, or structural gendered norms. And these are things like um, electoral processes, um, organization within NGOs or community organizations that facilitate certain men and women being able to participate in these organizations and certain men or women not being able to participate. This also goes along with issues like property rights or whether or not women can be seen or speak in public, that type of thing. So we're going to begin with talking about domestic water. In terms of gendered roles, in most developing countries, although not all, in most developing regions, in most communities, and most households, women are responsible for collecting water, for transporting it, for using it, and for managing it in the domestic sense. This also includes lots of girl children. And when I talk about domestic water, I mean things like using water to cook, to clean, to take care of the sick and elderly, to take care of children. And as we've seen here with this really heavy bucket in our volunteer, this isn't an easy task. This is very difficult. This takes up a lot of time during the day, sometimes hours. And as you've read about in our notes for this week, often, especially girl children, are withdrawn from school so that they can focus on collecting water every day. They don't have enough time to go to school. There's also issues of health. Carrying this heavy amount of water on our heads, on our backs, on our shoulders, can cause health problems in the back, in the pelvis. It's especially dangerous for pregnant women. And there are also issues of safety. Tripping and falling with this amount of weight on your head, 
Um, and also, as water quality and quantity diminish, people are traveling further and further to collect water, so safety issues increase. Traveling in areas that people or women are not familiar with may make them more tentative and worried about getting lost or worried about being attacked by animals or by other humans. So this division of domestic roles or the collection of domestic water as a gender role leads to a gendered knowledge. In terms of water quality, usually the person that collects water is more uh, knowledgeable about which water sources are better or worse, or better or worse for certain things. This is often based on things like odor or the color of water or changes in these. And often women can associate this change of water, odor, or color with illnesses in the household and can determine which water sources are healthier based on who's getting sick, as women are often caring for those who are sick. So as we read in our notes, it has been proven that projects that work on improving access to water, domestic water, without taking women's um, input into account, usually fail. And I'd like you to write in your notes here, in brackets, the example of Nepal. This is an example of a case study that you read for homework. I want you to refer back to this and refer to this section of the PowerPoint slide. It's a great example of how this connects and the problems that can occur with not understanding the gendered roles in water collection. Next, we move on to gendered norms or structures. So as we've talked about before in the class, women often lack a voice or power within society to claim what they need or what they want or to share their knowledge about domestic water. And as well, domestic water itself is often low on the priority list in terms of types of water use. It doesn't generate much re revenue, whereas agricultural or industrial water use does. So these are structures that are not allowing women to be involved in water management at a level that's higher than the household, such as community, region, government, etc. Now we'll move on to agricultural water use. Before we move on, though, I want you to try and estimate what percentage of women you think make up rural agricultural workers in the entire world. Put up your hand if you think agricultural workers are about 20% women, so 20% women, 80% men. Okay, a few of you. Now what about 50-50? 50% women, 50% men? Okay, most of you there. And then we also have, let's say, 70% women and 30% men. Okay, just a few of you. In fact, the latter are correct. So 70% of agricultural workers in the world are women. You may have underestimated because you may have been thinking of the term farmers. Usually when we hear farmer, we think of men, and women are simply helpers to their brothers or their sons or their husband's farm. Whereas, in fact, women are doing the majority of agricultural work in the world, and therefore, have a specific knowledge about agricultural water use. They're often working on subsistence crops. And this work of subs on subsistence crops gives them a specific gender knowledge about these crops, about medicinal herbs, for example, and also weather and climate patterns that have to do with the water retention and water needs of specific plants. So this is an important gender knowledge consideration that's often left off the table. In terms of gendered norms in agricultural water use, we've done a lot of reading about this this week. There have been many studies that investigate these. The main issue is in terms of irrigation rights. Um, women often lack water rights, and this is usually due to a lack of property rights. Property rights are usually entangled with water rights. So if you don't own the property you're farming on, if it belongs to your brother or your son, then you don't have rights to it. It's a similar thing if you're squatting on property and you're using it to, let's say, grow a vegetable garden for your family. You don't have the right to ask for water to use for agriculture. We also have issues of a lack of voice and power in society, the inability to speak up at a community meeting or to have a vote at such meeting, and uh, just a lack of being able to gain access to irrigation, which is usually a community-based decision and women often have to argue for such a right. Pricing schemes as well often block women out of the market. Any questions?